What is up, everyone? Welcome to the Locked on Cavs podcast, your daily look at the Cleveland Cavaliers. On today's show, Evan and I are going to talk about what Cavs president of basketball operations, Kobe Elvin, had to say about the Cavs season and why Shaden Sharp declaring for the draft is worth noting for the Cavs, even if he isn't going to fall into their lap. Let's get into it. All right, today's show, if you're listening in audio form, the music on the way and you heard was from Astro Radio. Subscribe to them on, check them out, excuse me, on Spotify or Apple Music. If you're just joining us for the first time, I'm Chris Manning. I cover the Cavs for places like Dime on Uprox and SB Nation for the Sword. That is Evan Damerel, who covers the Cavs and Cleveland Sports for Facebook's right down you could primarily. Evan, what is up, buddy? How are you on this Friday? I'm um, good, man. Tired, but good. It has been a week, to say the least. I am ready to recharge my battery this weekend, take it easy a little bit. Um, got a fuzzy on my sweater, but other than that, I'm all right. How are you? I'm doing good, man. Um, I am going to have a good weekend, and we're going to relax, and we're going we're gonna to keep moving here. As What are your big plans? Are you going golfing? Are you going to go play some soccer? What are you going to do? Uh, Jazzy's artist did get traded today, so we need to lock lock on Colum- locked on Columbus crew so I can discuss this with someone. Um, I'm not gonna dox myself. So uh, I don't I'm talk just gonna picture this. you kicking a soccer ball by yourself in a park, like giggling back and forth, or just like Sonic the Hedgehog playing baseball with himself in the first Sonic the Hedgehog movie, Look, which isn't make, bad. Make yourself happy, and uh, I respect anyone who's willing to do that. But Evan. Let's uh, let's touch on Kobe Almond. So earlier this week, we're we're a little behind this week. It's been a busy week, kind of chaotically for both of us. We are going to talk about what Kobe Almond had to say in segment one and segment two in his media availability earlier this week. Segment three, we're going to talk about Jaden Sharp. So I, I want to just unpack this Kobe Almond quote that I'm going to read it part of here. Uh, this is I think that one of the main Take things he's one of the main things he said in his availability quote. It was a success in that we were able to find an identity. We were able to play competitive basketball. Every last game down the stretch had real consequence. You can't call it playoffs, but there was postseason basketball back in Cleveland. Two games of Montemendo consequence that we're going to grow from as group. I think we're all thinking about possessions that could have been different, what we could have done different to get us there, and it's going to drive us. It's going to drive us to be more complete during the regular season and get to the playoffs. That has been so hard for us to capture the last few years, but we're right there. So what did you make of that comment? And, and am I right in kind of identifying this as maybe like his – kind of like big kind of view on kind of what he said in that in that media availability i think that is it's one of the more notable things he said during the media availability somebody asked me after the fact it wasn't you but um um i forget who asked it but i was just like kobe said a whole lot of things without saying much of anything he's very Um, good He's, he's, he's very good at that Uh, It was like an hour of just like kind of saying the same stuff in different ways, but like it didn't have a lot of substance to it, but you could glean certain things, which is why we're breaking it down a little bit. But um, yeah, I think it's interesting to note because I wasn't there in person. I was there on Zoom, so I had a little bit of technical issues and I did ask him like, hey, um, what is like your thought process going into this off season? Like, what are your goals? Like, what is your goals for next year? Things like that. And he kind of downplayed the expectation of playoffs. Cause I don't think he wants to put the public pressure and onus on this team saying like, hell yeah, we're going to make the playoffs. We're going to win 50 games next year. He knows this is a process. He knows that this was probably top 90 to 95 percentile in terms of just results for this team this year. Like the, we were talking about this in the beginning of the year, like for the Cavs to get to this point, we said they had a lot of things that had to go the right their way, and they did. Um, but I, I, I think this is a promising sign of things to come, and it's hard to fully understand where Kobe Altman is at. But um, he he's acknowledged like the Eastern Conference is really good, and it's only going to get better. And now it's just a bit of a race to kind of remain competitive and. They are not going to be the team. They're going to be a team with a target on their back next year. I think the Cavs players and coaches and everybody else have made this clear. Like, the, there's no expectation for them to be a surprise next year. People are going to expect the Cavs to be there next year. Now it's on Altman and his staff to kind of make sure that it's a little easier for them to do it. Yeah, look, I I look at where this team sort of is and, and what he had to say about this, and I think that the, the, the idea that the disappointment – could fuel them. I think it's certainly part of this. I think certainly. Oh, well, it's just a cliche. I think no, you can but, say. but I, yeah, but I think that's also true. I think it's a cliche because it's true. Because if you're this team, and you look at this year, and you look at where you got to, and you look at what you didn't get to, 
and whether you thought they would have done well against Miami or, or not, this is a situation where you got to kind of take what just happened and try to make it mean something more going forward. That is the reality of of getting, I think, where the Cavs got to. I think he's right in saying that they had consequence at the end of the year. The Cavs had not had consequence in games where, like, we would, like, if we're coming talking about this from, like, our perspective, games that we talked about, like, wouldn't have had value because we wouldn't have talked in March or April because we would have been thinking more about draft prospects than we would have been thinking about playoff seating and wondering if the Cavs could hang in the top six, right? The, I, I think the question, I think, I think what I poke at in that comment that I think is interesting, that I think is probably telling somewhat, but also like could change based on what the summer is, is that they said that he found they they quote found an identity because I think it dep- if you if he's pressed on what the identity is, I think the identity is that they have Darius Garland, Evan Mobley, and Jared Allen, and I don't th- and and maybe the defensive first stuff if JB Baker has as a head coach all of that stuff, I I still think because of how at the beginning of this process, the Cavs really are in a lot of ways because of how young their, their main guys are all that stuff. And because there, there's still like a lot of questions about what this roster is going to look like. I think the identity is more that they have three really good players to build around. And then it's about figuring out how to supplant them and really make your identity as a team the next couple of years and keep evolving. And as, as good teams tend to do, I think like saying that, like this is the template of what we're going to, if I don't think he's saying this, but I think if, if people read that and say, or hear that and say, okay, this this the, what the Cavs were this year is the template going forward. I think that's a misunderstanding of what's well, no. going on here. I mean, rebuilds and building te- the team building process. Like I said, it's more art than science, and it's fluid. It's incredibly fluid. Like you're you're noticing now in the playoffs, a lot of teams are starting to play bigger just because like you have like the Nuggets with like Demarcus Cousins and Nikola Jokic kind of working in tandem together. Or like Aaron Gordon's a bigger player as well. Um, the Nuggets are just my example, and also a player that our team JB Baker staff tries to emulate a little bit. But <clears throat> well, you also have teams that, teams that are that are playing smaller. Like you have Dallas. That's like, yeah. hey, we're gonna play it's Maxi also, Kleba. Yeah, we're like, gonna play Maxi Kleba at the five and Rudy Gobert. Deal with it. Like like that's what they're doing. That's it's, situational it's though too, because you can exploit yeah, how the that, the Jazz that, are poorly that, that, built. What, no, I know that's, that's what, what, what you're saying, are. but that's like. What the because that's what J.B. Bickerstaff said, too. He's like, listen, the Warriors kind of provided a template for playing small, but it's also really hard because you don't have Steph Curry or Kevin Durant or Clay Thompson or Draymond Green on the floor yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's really hard to emulate that system. So like you have to build your strengths. And the Cavs' strengths are playing big. Like It's worked. It's not a fluke. I think this is going to be their identity going forward. I'm curious to see how much of their identity going forward like will larry marketing be here next year will he be the starting three will the Cavs actually go get like an nba caliber wing and play them instead of the starting three spot and bring marketing off the bench with love is the other key bench bit. well like the Cavs have a lot of interesting pieces and a lot of fluidity and i'm we can talk more about it in the second segment but like that's something i really gleaned from kobe's availability is like what are the next steps and like one he seems like he's a proponent of keeping this draft pick all three draft picks that cleveland has in this upcoming draft but also it's going to really shape the team building process and i think he can give us some insight on maybe what the next steps are to flesh out this core three that they've kind of fallen into in the last two or three so years i think what where the Cavs are going to go from here will be really interesting. I think they're the way they build will be interesting. And I think because of how this business works, I think with the moves they make will kind of this quote to me will be worth going back and looking at in six months, seven months, maybe even as early as August when we see what this roster really looks like, you know, what happens with Sexton, what happens with Levert, you know, what kind of, what do they go get another, uh, their, the 2022, 23 season version of Ricky Rubio, right? Like there's things that I want to see what they do that will be rinsing and how they approach the draft, frankly, is, is part of that too. That will tell us some stuff. Okay. After the break, uh, we're going to talk about what Kobe Allman had to say about Colin Sexton. Uh, and, and that being, I, I think there, there's a, there's a comparison I'm going to make that will – I'm going to see how Evan reacts to it. But first, Evan, you're going to tell everyone about our friends at Shady Rays. You're absolutely correct. Today's episode of Locked on Cavs is brought to you by Shady Rays. Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that gives you the features of $200 sunglass, sunglasses for the fraction of the price. That means polarized lenses, well-constructed, durable frames, premium high-end finishes, and it's something you won't find anywhere else cause, because Shady Rays has an insane protection program as well. My pair of Shady Rays are in my car right now. I wish I had them on me. But Shady Rays 
again, more about this insane protection program. They include lost and broken protection on every pair. They'll send you a brand new pair if you lose them, no matter what happens. So if I happen to run mine over with my car, I can go get a new pair, then run that pair over and get another pair on top of that. Give them a try, and if you don't love them, you'll pay nothing. It's as simple as that. Plus, 10 meals are donated to fight hunger in America when you shop with Shady Rays. Exclusively for our listeners, head to ShadyRays.com and use code LOCKEDON to get 50% off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses. That's code locked on for the best deal of the season. 50% off two or more pairs of Shady Ray sunglasses backed by over 150,000 verified five-star reviews. And folks, if you struggle with doing basic math, you're essentially getting two pairs of sunglasses for the price of one of this deal. So that's pretty sick, especially with summer coming around and Cleveland's winter finally ending. All right, we're back here on Locked on Cavs. I'm Chris Manning. That is Evan Zamerl. Evan, here's what he, uh, he had to say about Colin Sexton in case people missed a quote. He, in reference to Sexton in a lot of ways, was the start of not only the rebuild, but the culture we have in place now. We asked him to do a, what he said in the past. We had asked him to do a tall task, four straight finals, and now we're sort of starting anew, and he was the start of that. We wanted to have a place that thrived from great attitude, great work ethic, and somebody that really wanted to be in Cleveland help us get back to those heights. He embodied every part of that, and he still does today. So he, in a lot of ways, is the reason why we're here, because he started that culture for us. He's enormously important to us. To lose him, you can see him throughout the year why we missed him or how we missed him. So I, this is how I view this. He's not going to come on and say like anything negative, obviously. That's not how this works. But what I do think it t- is telling yeah. that if you're his agency, which no free ads for his agency this time, they are just going to – they should absolutely show that to Kobe Alvin and say, hey, if you feel this way, give us the contract. We're looking show for. me the money. Show him the money. If you're, if you're, that, that is the kind of thing that you look at and say, okay – if you believe this, then let's 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 get it done financially. I also think like the comparison I will make here is in another Cleveland sports situation, a little bit different than this one, uh, a little bit of a of a different stakes in a lot of ways. Do, do we all remember not that long ago how effusive to some degree some of Brown's people were about Baker Mayfield before they then tra- or decided to go get the Sean Watson? Yeah, I mean, these you things were, can be lies. You rode with you rode with six. Yeah. But, oh, you're talking about the Browns in general. Yeah, you rode with well, six. I'm, well, but, I'm uh, yeah, I'm saying what what Barry and Stefan they they're not gonna you know. This they're is talking about the works. fans. I'm just like yes, yeah, Baker no, Mayfield fans there, are there, insufferable. There are, there, are, there, are, fans. there are still bigger Mayfield fans who uh, are being weird, but frankly embarrassing. But go ahead. Yes. These this, athletes are this, not your I, friends. Stop. I think I think this is all to me a reminder that what they can say publicly does not always indicate where this is. I think the way, no, how, effusive, how effusive they've been, how much Sexton has been around in, in public is sort of interesting to me in that in that sense, if we're reading the tea leaves. This is just a little bit like, let's earmark this and let's see where this goes in, in like a month or two. Yeah, let's see how this goes once the season concludes. We're in the technical new year of the NBA calendar, but um, I think it's just a positive step in the right direction. It kind of tracks with things you've heard, things I've heard, things other people have shared, where it feels more and more likely that Colin Sexton will be playing for the Cavaliers next season, but the Baker Mayfield comparison is an interesting one. Let's just say a talented can't-miss prospect just like falls into Cleveland's lap and then did the team who has said prospects as like, Hey, we want Colin Sexton. Let's just say like Colin Sexton, Karis Levert and a couple future picks. Like it'd be remiss of Cleveland not to explore that trade. Like, yes, Colin Sexton has been a key piece culturally. He's been a key piece both on and off the floor for the Cavs as well. Like, but it's also remiss as an organization to not flesh out and build properly around Mobley Garland and Allen because those are your three most important pieces, and those are your three only t- true untouchables on this roster. Like, yes, Isaac Okoro is available. Colin Sexton should be available. Karis LeVert should be available. Larry Marketing, Kevin Love, etc. cetera. Um, as long as you're not one of those three aforementioned players, you're available. And at the same time, like, it, it makes sense. Like, Kobe Alvin has said a lot of the same things about Colin. He's called him the cultural leader, like a dynamic cultural leader, I think is the exact phrasing he used uh, two years ago. And... It hasn't really changed. I think if you're the Cavs and I think if you are Colin's representation, you'll just say like, hey, let's talk about things. Um, One sec. Colin also did say when asked like, hey, about your contract situation, he's like, I want to be here. Like, I think I made it clear I want to be here. I think it means a lot to me if they keep me involved in like the personnel decisions and they keep me in not the personnel decisions, but like they asked for my input and my 
thoughts on like per, per, game prep, uh, play up, play and planning, things like that. And I think that is important. And also he like, it means a lot to him. And, but he also just threw it up to his agent and the Cavs front office say like, it's, it's not on me. I'm just going to go out there and keep playing my game and get better. It's just on those two sides to figure out like what's best for me and what's best for this team. And hopefully they can find a common ground. But Chris, let me ask you this, even though he had the meniscal tear, um, would you think it would be a bad call in Cleveland Spark just to offer the same contract you did last year? Maybe with a little less incentives and just like maybe a little bit more money up front instead of him having to like claw, claw to get it. What was the remind me what the number was? So it's been reported. Uh, apparently, Chris Fuller from Cleveland.com said it was similar to what Bogdanovich is making with Atlanta. Uh, Jason Lloyd reported it last year. I did too that it was four years. Um, or the Cavs only had five years, a hundred million. Colin wanted four years, a hundred million. If you could get him to sign to a five-year, hundred million dollar contract, and you're paying him twenty million dollars a year, would you think that's an abject failure on the Cavs' part? I think that's a pretty fair offer. And if you're them, maybe you just want to t- 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 wrap this up as quickly as possible, so it doesn't become more of a headache than it needs to be. I would need to see what the. Um, I'd have to number one. I think like the five-year timing. I would need to kind of look into how that kind of works uh on some of those deals because there can be some cba stuff in that i still think well, what as I'm long also- as it's not a max contract so let's say they sign garland to a five-year uh max deal that is one of your slots you're using okay. so, so then like because alan is on a five-year hundred million dollar deal it's sexing to be a five another five-year hundred million dollar deal then like two years down the line you sign evan mobley to that five-year max those are your two max spots between garland and mobley i think rogier the rogier contract feels just more I know that's a template they've used in negotiations in the past. Like, let's, what's it's, Terry Rozier making? Or, like, if you want to make it a shorter contract, let's say it's like a two, three year extension instead, just so the Cavs have a little bit of an out, I guess. And Rozier's like, was the, the deal he signed with Charlotte was three years. It'll be a free agent after, uh, I believe, next I'm looking season. up the exact numbers now. Yeah. That was a four year, $97 million yep. dollar contract that'll keep him through there through the 25, 26 season. Yep. So he has two more years left. Yeah. So in 21, 23, 24, 26, I think if I think th- I, I think 20 as an average is probably right. Just because of his age. So let's say if you're going to quibble over $3 million, my man. <laughs> no, no, Dan I know, Gilbert has, I know. The, the Gilberts have lots of Dan, money. They can afford this. He's buying Chelsea. You're a big fan. You and Larry Nance, bruv. Go blue. Back the blue, you know? I just, I can't with you. Um, I know. I, I just would like I to know see you're that. you're an I... Arsenal fan, Chris. I'm sorry. We haven't spoken in a few days, really, on the mic. This is where I, I'm going to be a real spicy baby troubling um i i i would be i will, will wonder the other thing about this that i will find really interesting is i tend to think that it makes sense for the Cavs to try to front load this to some degree like give him the oh absolutely money. the but, kobe but, altman special other than trading it, he has <clears throat> two, well kobe altman has two specials it is hey we're gonna front. give you we're gonna give you a front loaded contract well he actually no he has three he has three he has three specials it is hey we're gonna front load the contract that's one two we're going to give you like a good amount of money to come here, but we're also going to slap a weird non-guarantee in the last year of your deal. So like Jetty Osmond and Larry Markin and Jetty Osmond's fully non-guaranteed. And then Markin marketing's like the, caveat like a, is, is he's the one who approached the Cavs saying, let's make it happen. Cause he wanted that Chicago, but yes. And then yes. the third one, but, but, being, he's, but like Kobe Alban still did it. And there's like a $6 million like guarantee in the last year. And then lastly, there's the hey, you're an interesting player we got on the cheap. We're gonna sign you to a four year deal like that has basically a bunch of like non guarantee. Two point two million dollars a year and we'll yeah. guarantee it with like two well, other so players the, the, with a similar other, contract to make an upgrade. Yeah, other teams do that as well, all that stuff. But like it's it's a thing they do. It, the, the, I mean, the, it's what, smart. It's a smart way to manage the situation, I guess. Especially because 'cause their cap sheet's like a little wonky. Oh, their cap sheet's atrocious, so Yeah. The, what I what I will find interesting Not is, atrocious, but they have a lot of money now. And they have to pay a lot of money over this summer, next summer, and so on, depending on how they feel about Isaac Okoro and whatnot. Yeah, and like, look, there you. Ha- I think you have to be. I think the, the reason that the players in their camps don't always want those deals is because if you have like a lesser number, it makes you easier to trade, and then you have less control over over what you're playing. 
But if you're the Cavs, that is a, that is a hundred percent a scenario I'm exploring. I I I mean I said that I want to ask you this. I was on when I was on Chico uh, after dark last week. He asked me one through ten. You were there a few days ago, you little rat. Was it, uh, dude? A time, flat circle. Don't know any time anymore. Chris records with Chico before he records with me. Pass it on. Chico doesn't troll me. I troll Chico. Um, look. I don't know what he, keeps you in place. Me and your wife. <sighs> I'm much more scared of Leanne than I am of you. Um, I don't know. Leanne's terrifying, so I understand <laughs> that. He, I, he, asked me, he asked me one through ten, what What are the odds I think Colin is back? And I said seven out of ten. Where are you on that skill? Um, I'd say at 8.5. Okay. I just think there's too much public like friendliness with each other. I know they did a lot of this last year leading up to his contract extension, but it, it was down to the years. Like Sexton wanted to be paid $25 million annually. The Cavs wanted to pay him $20 million annually with guarantees to bump it up even higher. Um, and then, and then it sets in his agency has changed, which is, I think, a normal yeah, part Yeah, and of I this. think if you're – the important part of this is who the agency is and it, read between the lines here, but – also, the fact that his agency can also make the argument saying, like, hey, you could have used Colin a lot this season in, like, certain scenarios. And, like, if you want to retain someone like that, you should pay him like that. And, like you said, the Terry Rozier contract is, like, the base and the template. It's not a bad one. Maybe you just increase it more because the TV revenue is going to be kicking in, in, like, two years, I think, as well. So, like, this contract will be relatively meaningless in the grand scheme of things with how much more money the cast may have. But, I don't know. I think I'm more of a... 8.5 but depending on how let's just say the draft goes we'll say how free agency may begin because either cleveland signs into an extension almost immediately or they try to make other deals involving trades or other players and then they re- come back to Colin because they know like okay well he wants to be here maybe we can focus on other avenues first and hopefully that doesn't blow up in their face and if it yep. does that number slides way down for me. And yeah. it'd be weird to see. I'm just going to say it'll be weird to see him in another uniform just based on what I've gathered. And I think the Cavs are an organization who say a lot of cryptic things. But, and we'll talk about it in the final segment, just the one last pop thing I gleaned from Kobe's presser. But I don't think they'd put this much out in the ether if they weren't serious about extending Sexton. Yeah, yeah. That, that, Sexton to an extension. Yeah, that, that was to me like a thing ever since he was like very visibly like doing stuff with the team like at games. Yeah, like they've had him involved. I mean, I like, know not COVID restrictions like, were a yeah. thing and I was wrong on that one. The league lifted them, but um, once he kind of gained a little bit of mobility where he was able to kind of be away from Atlanta and be in front of Cavs doctors instead, it, he's been in cleveland a lot and like kobe joked that colin was still here he hasn't left for vacation yet like him and lomar stevens but it is what it is the kids yeah, lamar, lamar's on twitter being like where should i go eat breakfast and i'm like lamar i respect this all right after the break let's That's talk about let's talk about shade and there, there's there's a lot of here's the thing breakfast food if you just find a place that is like pretty competent and doesn't like mess it up, you're you're probably in, in a good spot. Breakfast is hard and it's easy to mess up if you overcomplicate it. Yeah. And there's a lot of places who will overcomplicate things. And there are some places who just have like five, six signature dishes that slap and you can have a good time over the time. Yes, all right. After the break, uh, I'm gonna explain why Shaden Sharp is worth noting, even if he's not necessarily. I like that on you enunciated it after because right I thought now. you said we we're gonna talk about Shannon Sharp in the notes. Nope. All right, but first, going to tell everyone about Built Bar. Built Bars are the best tasting protein bar out there, and look, they are going to help you try to be healthier in 2022 as the year goes on. Built Bars have incredible macros. So, 130 calories, four grams of sugar, four grams of net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Just go to built.com, scroll down to the macros chart, and you're going to be blown away. They're high protein, low calorie, high fiber, and low carb. They have dozens of amazing flavors in rotation all the time. Uh, Mint brownie, coconut, coconut almond, to name a few. They're all delicious, and new flavors are coming out all the time. If you think a flavor might be good, they're going to make it. It will be delicious, and it will be good for you. So go to Built.com, use the promo code LOCK15, and get 15% off your order. Again, the promo code is LOCK15 for 15% off at Built.com. They have peanut butter back in stock right now in addition to all the other flavors. So... Go check them out and try some Bill Bars today. Promo code LOCK15. 
All right, last segment here on the Lockdown Chaos Podcast. I'm Chris Tentevin. Evan, Evan here, here is just what I'm going to say about Shaden Sharp, the Kentucky player. Here's the 101. Number one, 6'6 guard from Canada who was enrolled at Kentucky, never played for the Wildcats, was considered the top prospect in the 2022 class, according to ESPN, before the reclassification and enrolling early. He was thought to maybe be going back early. It seems like John, Pal- John Calipari is still going to try to bring him back to Kentucky next year. I don't think that's going to happen. He uh, is not going to go back. He's not. He's going to be drafted well, eligible next year. Get, get, get your that money. money. Get that get money. Let money. someone bank on your potential, my guy. This is a very athletic wing with scoring versatility. I don't think this is a guy that if the Cavs end up staying at 14, Evan, uh, before we go, you're going, you are going to do a tankathon some before we go today. So I'm going to ask oh, you to get yeah, that. Of course. Going. But uh, he, what I think, why I think this matters, if you're Cleveland. He adds a wild card to the draft. He adds another guy in that top six ish, top eight ish range. Speaking of Tankathon, they have him currently going seventh to the Sacramento Kings. Okay. So if he goes in that range, he's maybe going to bump someone that's top 10 worthy a little bit further down in the draft. If someone maybe is going to take like a Dyson Daniels type at that seven eight range, maybe that bumps Daniels more into the Cavs range. Maybe this bumps someone into Cleveland's range at. Uh, you know, to to 10, 11, where like they can maybe trade up to go get someone if that person slips to 10 or 11. They'll have their two second round picks, some other stuff they want to try to move up a little bit to go get somebody if they want to approach it that way. Are you really that intrigued by Dyson Daniels? Yeah. I am. Even though the lack of three point percentage and the projected three point percentage is not great. I, I'm intrigued. There's there's a lots of guys in the draft. Okay, we can I, talk about Shade and Sharp, this, but this just is like not, pause. This is not Real a Dyson quick. Daniels. This is not a Dyson Daniels kind of I know, but you mentioned his name, and I'm eh, on him. I'd rather have Johnny Davis if I had to pick. But Okay, pick Johnny Davis. Pick whatever prospect but you the, want. So if you are a Cavs fan listening to this show, and I assume you are, um, Kobe Allman did say that they're going to be prioritizing shooting, length, and athleticism when it comes to their free agency and draft process. So... That screams forward to me, but go ahead with your well, point wing. take. They, they, they say wing, wing, it's wing, wing. It's a wing, wing player in general. So there, there's a yeah. So what? I, what? All and I there's an that, overabundance of wings that can dribble a little bit, or and or shoot in the range for Cleveland's picking. Yes. If if this helps one of those guys slip there, or allows them to maybe trade up a, a spot or two to go get the guy they want by using their second round pick or something, this helps them to some degree. This just adds. This isn't a, outside of the the the, the Chets. The the IVs the, the, the everyone at the top of this draft, those are guys that are gonna. We kind of know where they're gonna go. One, two, three, four. Palo, right? If you go down a little bit further, it the the depth you get different reads on. You get different understandings of where guys are gonna go. This 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 is a thing. Yeah, it's out of the top can, four. It's a bit of a crap shoot. <laughs> So if Sharp is in there and he's in the six to eight range or something like that, maybe this helps bump a guy. It gives the Cavs a little bit more juice to get someone in at that fourteenth pick if they end up staying. Um, um, yeah, sorry, I hit Tankathon, the Cavs got first, I'm gonna hit it again, just so we have a little more of an interesting discussion. Well, <laughs> but well, we'll have to do Shade, the... Shade, I, I like Shaden Sharp, I watched a lot of his high school tape, because I've been getting to know some of these prospects, like, I really like Ochai Agabahi from, I just butchered that, from Kansas, like, I think he's interesting, I like Ty Ty Washington at the Cavs, one of the drafted point guards, is truly back up Darius Garland. I like Terry Eason from LSU, but he's rising. I like Johnny Davis from Wisconsin. I like Benedict, Benedict Mathurin, even though defensively he doesn't seem that great. I like EJ Liddell from Ohio State. If the Cavs fall in love with him, we're able to trade back. Like Wendell Moore from Duke, like isn't a bad option either. Like the Cavs have options here. Well, M- Wendell Wendell Moore is more of a uh, second late round, first, late first, second, early second. Yeah. He uh, in the in the I'm doing a Twitter mock with our friend uh, at Mavs Draft on Twitter, one of our lockdown experts, and I took uh, the the guy from Kansas whose name I need to learn how to pronounce, and then Wendell Moore, with my with the two Cavs picks. Yeah, that's I think not a bad that, draft for Cleveland because you're stocking you're you're stocking your cupboard with wings that can shoot. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, and I'll, that's exactly what you need. Or if like you're the Cavs and let's just say Patrick Baldwin's available the late first. Maybe you take a swing on him because he was one of the top prospects in this draft class before going to Milwaukee and just looking bad for a very non-power school has tanked his draft stock. So yeah, the the there's options here. Like Kennedy Chandler from Tennessee intrigues me a little bit too. It's just like a guard off the bench for the Cavs. Like I think there's an avenue, and I've warmed up this idea more, just like looking at Cleveland's cap sheet and how much money they have to commit over the next few years to players and some hard decisions they may have to make. I think adding depth and restocking through the draft 
while signing some like marginal veterans with like your MLE or just two veteran contracts is kind of your strategy right now. And then you hope like you hit on one or two of these rookies, obviously, so you can just round out your rotation quicker. Yeah, I I think that there's a real argument to be made that these picks could have a lot of value. And look, I just just for the record, if somehow Shaden Sharp falls to even, fourteen, even even fifty eight, yeah, for the Cavs. Well, that one a little less so, but like top of the second. This, well, they the, could grab like Michael Foster Jr., who's like sixtieth on Tankathon right now, or do or some like, like or do some like cap grifting and just like draft yeah. a guy that will never come to the NBA, um, or like a, a two A guy that you or like get a, do the what um. Ziga Samar, to... who's a six-six point guard from Fulan Labrada. I'm trying to think of the guy for let's on Atlanta that played for is on the College Park. It was a second-round point guard last year for them. Just ended up signing a two-way. You have guys that just signed two ways. Like that's the kind of thing you could do with those picks if you want to get the scoop on yep. a guy. They might want to look at UDFA. And look, just just for the record, if Shaden Sharp for whatever reason, it probably isn't going to happen. But no, there's going to be a team who's intrigued by his okay. potential. Are let, you talking let, about Sharif Cooper? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, he's really so good. Really, really my, good. My, my, my point is that if he somehow falls to 14 and that happens, you run the draft cart up and you take him. Just for the yeah. record. If he is somehow slipped to 14, you you turn, you put yourself into the metaverse and you get to the, the podium as fast as you possibly can. I can help him get there if they need me to. But yeah. um, no, I agree. Shaden Sharp uh, would be really, really good for this Cavs team. I think there's a lot of interesting players the Cavs could nab at 14. I just think with how top-heavy this draft is, whether it's uh, Banchero or Holmgren or Ivy or um, Smith, like those are going to be your top four. It depends on how teams feel about them. I feel like Chet's going to go first just because of his entry, because he has like Rudy Gobert potential on defense with perimeter shooting sprinkled in. So like Rudy, Rudy Gobert, but like ability to do something on offense in the playoffs. Yeah. Um, listen, man, uh, the stifle tower will look really good in um, Charlotte. Nick Batum will pass on a good word about playing for Michael one, Michael Jeffrey Jordan, but um yeah, it's going to be an interesting time for Cleveland. Uh, we're going to be upping our draft coverage, I would assume. I just like talking about certain prospects. Maybe we talk about a different wing. Like, we'll really start breaking him down. Like, I really like Ab- Abjahi from um, Kansas quite a bit. Yeah, some people will say, like, his senior season was a bit of a fluke shooting-wise. But, like, I think there's something there because he's always been a competent three-point shooter. It's just, like he had to become more comfortable when he seeds into his game in Kansas. He's going to come along slowly, but I think he plays defense and that's the biggest thing for the Cavs too. Yeah. Uh, we're going to do more drafts of seven and remember this uh, next Friday, we are going to have uh, a, I believe Richard from at, at Mavs draft on Twitter on to do a little volume one of draft prospects to know. Um, we're going to start diving into those guys. As I much didn't know can. this. No, I don't check the calendar. I just check. Open I've, the I've made the say, calendar. Hey, this is what we're said, talking hey, about today. This is this is what we actually talked about this together. When we made this, and you just forgot. But on Monday, when did we talk about this? Like oh, like last weekend. Was it at the Hawks game? We I don't remember when, but I know we talked about this because might have been at the Hawks game. It was so loud I couldn't hear anyone talking. I was like overwhelmed with how loud it was. Because you scared the shit out of me that game too. Because I almost yeah. clocked you. Because the tough bad you scared me. Yeah, karma. Look, uh, on Monday, we are going to start a little four-part Darius Garland season wrap-up. We're going to do some more season wrap-up stuff next week. Monday, all about Darius Garland season arc, what he was, how important he was to the team, all of that stuff. Uh, next week is really going to be a very Darius Garland-focused week. So if you have some Darius Garland mailback questions, we're going to do an episode this week that is just questions about one Darius Garland. So get those in. Uh, tweet if them at Darius Lock Garland Cavs. questions, ask. Um, if you're hiring Boyd, we don't want to hear it. Okay, you just made it weird. You just made it weird. You've made it yeah. weird seven times this episode. Yeah. We're, we're back. Uh, tweet Rest them in t- peace to Eddie the Otter, if you know, you know. Okay, anyway, um, I'm going to land this plane and kick you off of it. But look, uh, and then tweet your questions at Lockdown Cavs, Lockdown Cavs at gmail.com. Next week, all about Darius Garland and draft prospects with Richard Stamen on Friday. Until then, I'm Chris, that's Evan. Be well. Have a great weekend. And uh, if you're going to go see the movie that uh, is really uh, – some kind of version of Hamlet. I will perhaps be there as well. Talk to you soon.